Hi, I'm Adam Kunzmiller with RPG Geek, and we're here at Gen Con 2014. I'm joined by Fred Hicks with Evil Hat Games. Hello. And we're here to talk about Atomic Robo and probably a few other things as well. Ah, uh, yes, a few yeah. things happened. Why don't we start night. with Atomic Robo? What can you tell me about this? Uh, it's based on a uh, popular indie comic book series uh, published by Red Five, um, written by Brian Clevenger, illustrated by Scott Wagner. It's about an immortal atomic robot invented by uh, Nikola Tesla early in the 20th century. Nice. Um, and uh, over the course of uh, you know the next hundred years, uh, because the comic can jump around in time and different things, different storylines happen in different points in the mm -hmm. timeline. Um, uh, he uh, eventually builds up a uh, uh, company slash organization called Tesladyne. Um, in this universe, essentially almost every uh, like science hero pulp. Uh, person who would become a pulp hero in like a, a different sort of sure. setup ends up working for Tesladyne as like an action scientist. <laughs> so it's the action science role playing game. Uh, expect uh, explosive uh, hypothesis testing. Um, uh, we've got a fun brainstorm mechanic in it. Right. Uh, and this is a fate game. So what sort of things has this done to kind of tweak that fate system? Uh, well, uh, one of the things I particularly wanted to have happen with this, in part because of that hopping around in the timeline. Uh, when I was talking with Mike Olson, who did the system development on it, uh, I said we need this to be something where instead of the usual thing that we've uh, sort of defaulted to in Fate of sit down, have a session where you're doing character creation, everyone's working together, backstory. No, you show up with as little detail about your character as possible. Right. You jump in, you start playing in uh, like five minutes or less. Yeah, I noticed reading through that there were a lot of portions in the book where it says, don't worry about figuring this out until yep. you need to. Exactly. Just I start mean, playing. Because part of our thing was, what if you want to do like a time hopping uh, uh, storyline? Uh, like an adventure that doesn't just occur in 1950, but occurs, because this is actually in one of the volumes of the graphic novel, that occurs in uh, 1910, 1950, 1970, and 2000. Like, how would you do that with, unless everyone is playing an immortal atomic robot, Right. Um, uh, how would you do that so, such that there's character persistence? You wouldn't. Um, and what if things happen in the game where the GM's like, you know, the next thing shouldn't be in this thing where I was happening next. Right. We're gonna need to do that. Okay, let's do this one in the 1970s. Okay, we've only got two players who've shown up for the for the adventure tonight. Uh, you're always playing Robo, cool. How about you play Carl Sagan? And I'm like, okay, Carl Sagan, um, billions and billions, uh, right. you know, a couple other things, you write down just a few details and you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the rest of the details can be filled in uh, over the course of play. It's even to the point where maybe you encounter a situation and go, you know, I'm pretty sure Carl Sagan would have a stunt that allows him to do this. And you, and you write down he has then. this stunt. Yeah, exactly. It's, right. it's very much about, uh, uh, we've always had sort of an attitude uh, in Fate that uh, character creation is play. Right. So, uh, you know, in the earlier uh, things you'd see uh, the, the, the backstory set up as a kind of a fun play activity, but in here, it's more play as character creation, mm -hmm. right? We sort of flip the, flip the uh, sentence on that so that as you're uh, uh, getting into uh, the, your adventure for the moment, um, you might be picking up a different character or you might be playing a different iteration of that character because uh, even though Robo is immortal, he's not unchangeable. Sure. Um, so it's like 1950s Robo has a different set, sort of set right. of things going right. on for him. So you might take your sheet and just adjust it a little bit or something like that. I also noticed in this that it takes, makes a lot of use of what you call modes. Can you give a quick overview yeah, of what um, those are? Uh, modes are part of what makes it so that you don't need to have a, like a long skill list uh, of uh, that you're picking from and going. Okay, which one is this right now? It breaks things down into. I think our basic modes are uh, action, intrigue, science, and I'm gonna forget the fourth one. And another one that. And another one fits in there really well. Um, uh, <laughs> right, but so people uh, would rank themselves in the, those things very quickly, and each of those constitutes a group of skills and your rating in the mode is your default in all of those. And then you can say, you know what, I've got science at good, but this guy is specifically a physicist, so let me take one of my points in that because now we're working on a physics problem. Right. And because now, now, like as would be revealed in that panel of the comic, oh, this guy is a physicist. Let's rate him up on that now and then roll. Um, but if you don't even feel like making that decision, you can always just go with the rating of the mode. Uh, to go forward, it's all about uh, part of that speed thing. So you can very quickly. Also, it kind of forms a top line on your character sheet. Mm -hmm. So you look across it, see your three modes, see them in sure. essentially descending order of priority, and that gives you a very quick understanding of okay, what is this character that I'm playing, 
uh, uh, what, you know, in a very general sense. Uh, is this sort of an action problem? Okay, well, he's high ranked in that, so this is the thing that he's going to be running at, yeah. while the other guys who have science first are going to go over to this part of the problem. And you can really see, uh, you mentioned, you know, this is based on an indie comic book. You can really yep. see that in the, the format of this book. The yeah. layout's really beautiful. We've, uh, we've embedded a lot of uh, panels with, like, full dialogue and all of that from the comic book in there, and we have uh, little headshots uh, from the various characters as though they are playing the game right. that is making that story in the comic book happen, explaining how the events in each panel are manifesting in the mechanics. So mm -hmm. it's a, for people who are very visual learners, uh, rather than you know, reading learners, and I have a lot of sympathy for you because though I publish <laughs> books, I'm not the best reader out there. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a new uh, vector sure. for loading, that, loading an understanding of the system in your brain. Uh, okay. It's been, the people who have uh, picked it up early have been very, very happy with how it uh, teaches fate. So this sounds really exciting. Is this available for wide release now? Yep, yep, it's, right. in, uh, it's in distribution. Uh, we ran a pre-order uh, on our website and got all those shipped out um, last yeah. month, so uh, uh, I think it was last month. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm traveling through time too. Um, uh, so, and it's also eminently hackable. Um, so you know, if you want to do things other than action science, a lot of people sure. looked at that and said, this is also a Hellboy role-playing game if right, I wanted to, or right. something like that. There's, I think that's there are lots one of, of the, ways to the hallmarks it. of the fate system in yeah, general. It like, really lends itself to this. And we're very friendly to hacking, so if somebody wants to get in there, rip out the guts, and do something else, great. We're going to support you and uh, say that that's exactly the right way to do it. All right, well, and that was Atomic Roro, the role-playing game. So switching gears a little bit, you also have a Kickstarter going right now, Yeah, right? Uh, we're uh, Kickstarting, uh, <laughs> and we've already hit a number of stretch goals, uh, the <laughs> Designers and Dragons. It's a four-volume series written by uh, Shannon Applecline. He's one of the people behind RPGNet. Uh, no offense. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, and uh, he has been spending the last 10 years uh, digging deep, getting uh, all sorts of stories about the various companies of the role-playing game industry. And uh, it's... I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to misspeak here, but I think it's like something like one and a half million words wow. spread across those four volumes. The first volume on the 70s, which is... Uh, we're dividing things up by decade based on the founding date of the uh, companies. Um, uh, is going to be 400 pages in a 6x9 format. Wow. The TSR uh, history alone is 100 pages, and uh, you can download that for free on our website uh, to get a, a look at what it's like before you even back. Uh, if you back even at just the $15 level, um, you will get uh, uh, eventually uh, digital copies of all four volumes, and that's like easily half off of what we're going to be selling them for digital later. Uh, right. But it, it kind of blew up on us. We did a like sort of a soft pre-launch. Our official announcement launch was going to be on Tuesday. Right. Um, we soft launched it in the middle of the day on Monday. Uh, hit our goal and first three stretch goals by the time we were to our wow. uh, yeah, just just past our official launch time on Tuesday. Excellent. Uh, it's now up, uh, and that was around twenty-two thousand. It's now up around sixty sixty-eight thousand. Last awesome. I checked. And I hear and, you also. Uh, it's racing forward. I hear you also did pretty well in the Emmy Awards this year. Yeah, yeah, we did all right. Um, we were nominated in, I want to say, eight different categories. Mm -hmm. um, I might have to get out my phone because I can't remember them off, off my head. But we, in those eight categories, we placed at least silver in every single one of them. That's great. Uh, with, uh, I think, it's golds for best game, uh, best family game, and the third one that I always forget whenever this comes up. <laughs> all right. And I think we also had a question in the chat while you're here. Can you tell us kind of the origin of Evil Hat as a company? Name? Yeah. Um, well, Evil Hat was originally uh, just sort of uh, uh, myself, Rob Donahue, and uh, Lydia Leong. Uh, we used we wa we wanted to run some uh, like uh, LARPs at Ambercon Northwest, mm -hmm. uh, and we wanted to kind of give a name to like the group that we were, sure. so that people would always. If, even if they didn't remember us, they'd go, oh yeah, those guys ran this cool thing last time, I want to play that yeah, again, makes right? Sense. Um, so I, that kind of made me go, we need a brand for this. And one day we hung out on, on a line chat room and my friend Lydia comes in and says, uh, Lydia perches on Fred's hat, head like an evil hat. I'm like, evil hat, evil hat, that sounds interesting. I just kind of went around in my brain and I'm like, evil hat eats brains. They gets your teeth into it, yeah, all right. right? And it just kind of, and, and it just started to click for me. I said, okay, so we're going to do Evil Hat Productions. This is an Evil Hat production, uh, and then it just started to make sense when we moved towards becoming a publisher instead of just a you know group running games uh, to use that because our we wanted to make very grabby. Uh, uh, you know, sure. products that would latch onto your brain yep. and not let go. So I think now that I know that, when I, hear, when I see Evil Hat now, I'm going to picture Lydia perched on your head. <laughs> <laughs> Just, exactly, uh, exactly. All right, great. Well, once again, that was Fred Hicks with Evil Hat Games. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Cool. That was awesome.